small things can have a massive impact. And we've been spending time looking at these, these four small books in the New Testament, that last third of the Bible, that has four books, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, and Philemon, that are just tiny little books. I mean, in my Bible, the book of Philemon is less than one page. That's the entire book of the Bible. If you want to read a whole book of the Bible in one day, check this one out, because it's, it's, a, it's a quick one. But I got to tell you, the book of Philemon is short, but it's explosive, I mean, it is explosive for two reasons. One, for the message, and two, for the context. The message is about forgiveness. And forgiveness is one of the two biggest, most explosive topics that I get to preach on from the Bible. The other one is finances and generosity. Those are the two times when I get people coming to me, arguing with me or debating or upset that I preached about generosity or forgiveness. So well, why would people come to you and have a problem with a sermon on forgiveness. Here's why. Because they'll say this to me. They'll say, hey, hey, listen, listen. I know the Bible says to forgive. I know God wants us to forgive. But if you knew what he did to me, if you know what she did and how she treated me, you'd know why God thinks I shouldn't have to forgive that person. I mean, I know that in general people are supposed to be, God's given me a special exemption and I'm holding on to my bitterness. So the topic is a tough topic. And then the context. What's so difficult about the context of Philemon? Well, it's it's set it's set right in the middle of first century Roman culture, where slavery was normal, wrong, ungodly, unjust, but it was normal. And so you're you're reading this this little snapshot of a tiny little book, and it's right in this time in history that's just extremely challenging. And we'll talk more about that. So so it's a, the topic of forgiveness and the context of slavery. You go, man, that's a, that's a double difficult uh, thing to think about. And, and yet, we're going to today grapple with this. So, Lord Jesus, we pray as we open your word, as we look at the book of Philemon, this teeny little postcard of a book, we pray it will have an explosive impact on our lives in teaching us of your forgiveness and the call from you that we would forgive others. Speak to our hearts today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I want you to imagine with me you're going to see a movie. You got a friend meeting you to go see a movie. So you're going to go over to the mall here in Monterey and you're going to see a movie with a friend. So you get there and you're responsible. So you get there 10 minutes early and you're kind of waiting in front of the theater, waiting for your friend to show up. And five minutes goes by, they haven't shown up yet. And then you get a text running late, find a seat, save me a seat, see you soon. You get a ticket, you go in, you get settled in. You know, you're waiting for your friend. You know, it's going to be okay because there's going to be like an hour and five minutes of previews and stuff. So, you know, you're. <laughs> And they'll be fine, but you get through the, you know, the 20 minutes of previews, and then the movie starts. And you're five minutes in, 10 minutes in, 20 minutes in, 25, 35 minutes into the movie, your friend is, you know, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, kind of going across people's legs, sits down next to you. And they ask you the most horrible question in the world. They lean over to you and they whisper, what I miss? What's happening? And you say to them what any civilized dignified human being says. You look at them and you go like this. Because you don't talk in a movie theater. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. And so, and so then, so then there, there they say, you watch the movie. Well, there's about 20 minutes left in the movie. And they get up. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And they leave. And they don't come back. And you fin the movie finishes. And you walk out and you see that they're in a line, this massive line, waiting to get junior mints. They got a box of junior mints. And I know they're tasty, but come on. And so they're waiting in line to get junior mints. And you wait for them. They finish to get the junior mints. And then they, they go, let's go watch the rest of the movie. You say, it's over. They say, well, that was short. And uh, <laughs> so, so you do what you do. So then you, so then you walk across and you go, you're going to go over to Lala Grill right across. You're going to go get some dinner, right? And, and, and you're going to order the quesadilla because you know that's, that's a dinner and lunch tomorrow and lunch the day after that because they're <laughs> massive. You know, so you, you sit down, you're, you're getting ready to have your meal. And this friend of yours looks at you across the table and they, and they dare to say this. They say, that movie didn't really make sense. I could not follow the storyline. And you're thinking, well, of course not. You missed the beginning and you missed the end. How do you know? How, why would you think you would know the storyline? Now, why do I tell you that crazy story? Because the book of Philemon, this little book, is just like that. It's 25 verses long. And we don't know what happened before, and we don't know what happens afterwards. We walk in in the middle of the story, and we leave before the story's done. 
So it can be a very, even though it's short, it can be a very confusing book. But I believe if we make a decision to listen to this book, to learn from this book, if we can hang in there to get through some of the challenging aspects of the explosive topic and this explosive context, I believe God will speak to us in explosively powerful ways. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to get on the train with me and study Philemon and stay on the train till 30 minutes from now when we finish the message. And don't jump off the train if something bothers you, because something might bother you. But I want to ask you to hang in there to the end of the ride, because I think at the end of the ride, if you let your heart and your mind stay with God's word, God will challenge you and speak to you and change you. And I, I believe a very profound and a very powerful way. So here's what we know. What I want to do is I want to give you the setting. I want to give you the background of Philemon. I want to set the context for you. And I want you to kind of Sherlock Holmes this a little bit. I want you to think like Sherlock Holmes, start to put the pieces together as I'm giving you the context, because if you get these pieces of the story, what leads up to it in the historical setting, then this letter can make sense. If you don't have the background, it's really hard to get what's going on here. So here's, here's what we know, okay? Three primary characters in this one little book of 25 verses. The Apostle Paul... This guy who had been very religious, but very anti-Jesus, who had been converted to Christianity, loved Jesus, was planting churches and helping pastors and churches, traveling around. And at this point right now, he's locked in jail because he's been preaching Jesus. So you have the Apostle Paul. Then you have a friend of his named Philemon, lives in another town, in another place. And Philemon is a follower of Jesus, is, is loving, is growing in faith, is deeply committed to Jesus. Now, stay with me. And he's also a slave owner. And you go, well, you just said he was a Christian and he loved Jesus and he, and he was growing in faith and now you're telling me he was a slave owner. Yes, those things all, and this is why I said stay on the train with me. Stay on the train, okay? Because Philemon lived in a world, first century Roman world, where slavery was, was not only within the law, it was the norm. William Barclay, one of the greatest Bible commentators that's ever lived, estimated there was probably six, uh, 60 million slaves in the first century Roman world, in the overall Roman Empire, 60 million slaves. So there is a good chance if you or I had been born in the first century in the Roman Empire, we would have either been a slave or in a household or a family that had slaves. You say, well, how can you say that? Because almost every household and every family had slaves. It, it, was, it was that normative. Now listen closely. I'm not saying it was right. It was completely wrong. I'm not saying it was good. It wasn't. It was totally ungodly. I'm not saying we shouldn't look back in some way and just say, that was wrong and point a finger because we've got to make that judgment, right? But I'm telling you, it was so normative that if we, just, if we say, okay, Philemon was an evil, bad person because he had slaves. We, we can't go there yet. We've got, you've got to hang in there longer to hear the whole story, okay? All right, so you've, you've got the Apostle Paul. You've got his friend Philemon, and Paul is writing this letter to Philemon. Here's the third person, Onesimus. Onesimus is a slave who's owned by Philemon. And Onesimus has either stolen some things and run away, or he's been sent by Philemon to do a task and hasn't returned when he was supposed to. In either case, he's in a bad situation. Because as a slave in the ancient world, when you have run away or when you don't return when you're told to return, you can be branded, you can be beaten, or you can be killed. Under law. So, this is Onesimus. So now we've got the Apostle Paul a friend of his, Philemon, who's a somewhat newer Christian, but walking with Jesus, and Philemon. So th th you have to get those characters to get a sense of what's going on here, all right? Now, I want to say something else also. Just because uh, you recognize something, just because you recognize something is real and what it is, doesn't mean you affirm it. To look back at, at first century Roman world and say, it is real that there were people who owned slaves. Other, and they, they owned human beings, who they saw as non-people property, they could do anything that they wanted with. It was absolutely, utterly evil, wrong, and wicked. But it was normative. By saying it was normative doesn't say you're approving it. You're saying, I understand historically what the world was like at that time. Does that make sense? All right. Stay on the train, because I know this, there's people, there's buttons that can be pushed. I, don't want, I just want you to stay and hear what's going on here, all right? So you've got Paul, you've got Philemon, you've got Onesimus. And, and here's the beautiful thing. Somehow, when Onesimus leaves Philemon, whether he runs away or whether he's sent, he ends up connecting with the Apostle Paul. And when Onesimus, the slave, meets the Apostle Paul, he hears 
about the good news of Jesus, that there is one who can break your chains and set you free and give you new life and new hope no matter what your history has been, no matter what your background is. And Onesimus has become a follower of Jesus. He's given his heart to Jesus Christ. And he's become not only friends with the Apostle Paul, he's become like a spiritual son to the Apostle Paul. Okay, you get in the background? The Apostle Paul, Philemon, his friend. Philemon has a slave, Onesimus, who's now found the Apostle Paul in some way or another. And again, we don't know the beginning of the movie. We don't know how it started. So we don't know how they were connected. But we know that he's found the Apostle Paul. Excuse me. And they become friends. Onesimus has become a Christian. And now what's happening is Onesimus is going back to Philemon. All right? So the Apostle Paul knows that Onesimus is going back to Philemon. If Onesimus is caught with, with, as a runaway slave, he could be executed. So he's now going back to Philemon. And this teeny little book in the Bible, this teeny 25-verse book, is the letter that the Apostle Paul writes to his friend Philemon to prepare the way for Onesimus' return. Because he doesn't want him Onesimus to be branded, beaten, or executed. He wants him to be loved and embraced. And so the Apostle Paul is writing to Philemon saying, for this to happen, Philemon, you have to have a radical change of heart. He's saying, Philemon, I know that you grew up in a culture that looks at certain things as right and wrong, but the culture is wrong and Jesus is right and we're gonna change your thinking and change your heart and change your behavior. Because listen closely, that's what God does to his people. He changes us. When we become a Christian, in one moment, you become a Christian. It takes a lifetime to be sanctified, to grow up into faith. I've been a Christian now for 40 years and a pastor for over 30 years. And <coughs> there are still things that God is showing me in my heart, in my attitude, in my words, in my life that are wrong. Have you ever had that where, where God shows you something in your heart that's wrong and sinful? I've had that, and I say, God, I've been a Christian now 40 years. Why are you showing me that now? Why not 40 years ago? God says, because we were working on 25 other things 40 years ago. <laughs> you know, you weren't ready for this one now, but now, this is, now it's time to start growing in this area. I mean, that's the journey of following Jesus. He's transforming us over time. So the apostle Paul sends this letter to Philemon, getting him ready to receive Onesimus back. Now you got the beginning. You missed the first 35 minutes of the movie. Now you're kind of caught up, okay? So now we're gonna pick it up right there. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Philemon. If you have your, your, your phone or your app, just open up to Philemon. It's only one chapter long. Just go to the book of Philemon. We're going to start in verse 8. Now, with that in mind, listen to what the Apostle Paul says to Philemon. This Christian who's growing in his faith, helping lead a home church, but also has slaves. And the Apostle Paul is trying to change things in the world and in his world. He says, therefore... Although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. The Apostle Paul is saying, in Christ I could tell you, you have to receive him back. You cannot harm this man. You have to treat him as, he said, I could, I could demand of you. But he said, I'm not going to do that. There, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought. I love this, verse 9. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Paul says, says Philemon, I want to appeal to you in love. What's he talking about? He says, it's none other than Paul. I'm an old man. Now I'm a prisoner for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Listen to what the apostle Paul is saying. He's saying, Philemon, I'm sending back a person who you thought wasn't even a person, a person who you thought was, was cattle, was, was a tool in your tool shed. And I want you to know, he's my son. He's that close to me. This, this is a person. He's undermining the very institution of slavery. And he's also undermining the condition of our hearts. When we have a certain way we see the world through our family's eyes, through our culture's eyes, through our sinful eyes. And we have a certain way we see things and God's got to strip those things away. God's been doing that to me for 40 years and he's still doing that to me. And God is using the apostle Paul to say to Philemon, listen, this, this person who's coming back to you, he, sa he says, he is, he is my son Onesimus who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. It's interesting that the name Onesimus, there's a play on useful, useless, and Onesimus. He's saying, he's saying his, his, even his name, he's, he's now useful to you and to me. Verse 12, Paul says, I am sending him 
who is my very heart. Paul says, I'm sending this person back to you. He is my heart. He's not just a person. He's not just my son in the faith. He, I'm, I'm, giving, I'm sending you my heart. He's saying, you better, you better treat him right, right? I'm sending it to you. He was my very heart back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. He's saying, he's been serving. He's been faithful. We've been doing ministry together. I wish he could stay. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you would do uh, would not seem forced but would be voluntary. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Listen to verse 16. This is radically countercultural. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Why does he have to say he's a fellow man? Why would he have to say that? What's the answer? Because in first century Roman world, slaves were not seen as people. Paul is, is tearing apart and ripping off the scales of this lie and this deceit of slavery. But he's doing one life at a time, one person at a time. So he says, he says this, I'm sending back this man. He, he, you know, he's now your brother in Christ. He's changing his vision and his view of how Philemon would see Onesimus, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. See what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, I'm the one that came and preached to you. I'm the one that shared Jesus with you. I'm one, I'm one that you view with having, like, like your pastor. I want you to treat him like you treat me. That's a bold ask. But, but that's the heart of the Apostle Paul. That should be our hearts. If he has done anything, if he has done you any wrong, listen to this, or owes you anything, what does Paul say? Charge it to me. I'll pay his bill. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. <laughs> you know, when somebody starts a sentence with not to mention, <laughs> what are they going to do? They're going to mention something, right? <laughs> so as well, not to mention, you know, get ready. He said, I don't, not to mention, but Paul says, Philemon, you owe me your very spiritual life. You came to know Jesus through my ministry. A little leverage there, right? But he's saying, I, I want, to want you to remember. Because he, he, is, he is making sure that when Onesimus comes back, he is not branded, he is not beaten, he is not executed, but he is loved and embraced and treated not like a slave, but like a brother. It, 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 it maddens me that people will take a book like this who don't know the Bible and say, oh, there's a whole book in the Bible about a guy who sends a slave back to a slave owner and says slavery is fine. What a ridiculous misreading of this text. This is an absolute intentional subversion of the sin and the wrong and the evil of slavery. In, in the ancient world, in, in the ancient Roman Empire, if there were 60 million slaves, for Paul to stand up and go to the Roman government and say, listen, I want you to overthrow slavery, he'd, he'd have been executed or thrown out. But you change the world one life at a time and one person at a time. And see, I, I, can't, under, I, don't, I can't get these massive you know, epic theological concepts, but I can get this. One person, the Apostle Paul, writing a letter to one real person, Philemon, about one real slave, Onesimus, and saying, this is going to change. Because it becomes a model for all of us. You know what it's a model of? That we better check our hearts and our eyes and our attitudes. Because even when you come to faith in Jesus, we still have blinders and blind spots and sinful patterns in our lives and in our hearts, and we don't even see them. I got ways I see the world because I'm a Harney. And I grew up in the Harney household. And there's ways that my family saw the world. And some of those things are good, but some of those things are not good. And God has had to strip some of those things away and say, Kevin, you might think this is normal because it was a normal Harney thing, but it's ungodly and wrong, and you've got to change your attitude. There's attitudes I've carried because I was born and raised and breathed the air of our culture and our nation. And some of the attitudes in our culture are not honoring to Jesus. And God has had to strip those things away and say, no, no, it's the heart of Jesus, not the heart of your nation. It's the heart of Jesus, not the heart of the Harney family. It's the heart of Jesus, not the heart of Kevin. And the journey of walking with Jesus is time after time allowing God to show us where we're wrong. And that's what God is doing from Paul to Philemon about Onesimus. But I can get one life to one life to one life. 
And I can say, okay, God, what do you want to say to me? That's why I don't want anybody getting off this train before we get back to the station. Because, because we've got to hear what God has to say to us. So here's some lessons. The call to grace and forgiveness. Uh, th- th- there is a call to live in grace and forgiveness. The example of Philemon and Onesimus, even though it's, it's, it's embedded in a strange culture that we don't understand, even though we can look back historically and say, I don't know, it bothers me. I don't like the way this all fit in that culture at that time. I don't, I don't understand that culture fully, but enough to know that, that for Philemon, he was a product of his culture, but God was stripping that away and replacing it with the kingdom of God. But that takes time. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Is anybody here fully formed, completely into the image of Jesus with no sin and no struggles? Anybody just raise your hand if that's you. Okay, I mean, this is the journey we're on. And so we get this beautiful picture of how this unfolds. And there's a call to grace. There's a call to forgiveness. And it's for each one of us. Who is that person that has wronged you, that has hurt you, and you've chosen not to forgive them. And it's been a week, and you're not going to forgive them. It's been a month. You're not going to forgive them. It's been a year. You're not going to forgive them. It's been a decade. And the poison of unforgiveness is destroying your soul. But you're not going to forgive them. And you have all the justifications, all the rationalizations why you shouldn't. You know, Philemon could have said, listen, it's within, it's within Roman law. It's standard cultural things. But God had to tear that down. We have to dare to say, God, would you search my heart and teach me what it means to walk in grace and forgiveness even when I might have a right to not forgive. I might have you know, excuses and ra- all my friends say, oh, you shouldn't forgive her. You should never forgive him. I mean, all my friends agree with me. Therefore, it must be right. No, Jesus is right. Not my friends, not my heart, not my culture. Jesus. Next, we see the undermining of the system of slavery. It is not an option to try and turn over the, this, this, this system of all of Roman law. For the Apostle Paul, to, to turn over the whole system of Roman law wasn't an option, but he could tackle it one at a time. And so when the Apostle Paul, in, in two other times in the New Testament, there's household codes. It's, it's like, here's how husbands treat wives. Here's how wives treat husbands. Here's how parents treat children. Here's how children respect their parents. And it bothers people. Say, and then here's how you treat your slaves. It's right there in the Bible. You go, that's horrible. How could that be in the Bible? Because in almost every home in the ancient world, there were slaves. And if you read those passages, it, it gives a dignity and a love and a service and a humanity that didn't exist under Roman law. But the law of Christ usurps that, overturns it, undercuts it, and deals with it over time. And that's what God is doing. And then there's new thinking. And really what, what the Apostle Paul is saying to Philemon is he's saying, you've got to change your whole way of thinking because Onesimus is coming back and you, and you, you better treat him right. You better not lean on Roman law or your own cultural norms. You better treat him the way Jesus would treat him. And that's a whole different way of seeing the world. So the Apostle Paul says, understand this. He's family. You know, Paul's saying, he's my spiritual son. Paul's saying, I'm sending my son to you, Philemon. His name is Onesimus. He's not the same person he was. But understand, I'm I'm sending my son. You better treat him right. He's loved. The idea of saying, I love this person who's a slave didn't exist in the first century. It exists among Christians because we don't think like the world thinks. He's valuable. He's useful. He's gifted. The Apostle Paul says, understand that, that he's not just, just something to be thrown aside. He's a person, he's a person of dignity and value. He, and this is the most radical thing. He is no longer a slave. Word for word, that's what the biblical text. Paul says, he is no longer a slave. Well, in the culture's eyes, he was still a slave. What's Paul saying? In Jesus Christ, you set people free. That's what we do. He says he's no longer a slave. He's your brother in Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, if he's my brother, guess what, Onesimus? I mean, guess what, Philemon? Onesimus is your brother. My my spiritual son is coming to you, my brother in Christ, but your brother in Christ. So Philemon, treat him right. And ultimately, Jesus breaks down every barrier. Jesus tears down barriers. And this, this is what God wants to do in our hearts and our lives. We, we can take a little book like this and we can just you know, fly past it. It's just one page long and skip it or say, I don't understand. I don't understand how this all works in the ancient world. Or we can dig in and understand that in a, in a, in a book like this, there's this beautiful picture that we can understand. One human being, the apostle Paul, changed by Jesus, writing to another human being, Philemon, saying, Philemon, you're a Christian now. I know you've been a Christian a while, but you're not totally Jesus-like yet. 
You're not totally sanctified. There's things in you that need to change. And if you operate when Onesimus comes home like a Roman citizen, it's going to be a problem. But you don't operate like a Roman citizen. You operate like a citizen of the kingdom of God, like a child of Jesus Christ. And this guy coming home, he's not a runaway slave or somebody who didn't fulfill their duties. He is your brother. He is not a slave. He's a person. That is subverting and undermining the entire institution of slavery in the ancient world and in any time. That's what Christians should do. So the Apostle Paul is standing up and doing that, but he's doing it one life at a time. Paul is not affirming slavery and injustice. He is undermining it. Listen to this. Injustice will always fail and fall in the presence of the grace and the love of Jesus. But it often takes time. Life by life, day by day, moment by moment. But if every Christian hears the voice of Jesus and responds in a Christ-like way, it will change our world. So new actions and lifestyle. I want to just share, share some thoughts and some ideas about how this can impact our actions, our lifestyle, and how we should live. Here's the first, here's one lesson I learned from, from walking through the story of Philemon and Onesimus and Paul. Gentle appeal and not harsh demands. I love this. The apostle Paul speaks to Philemon. And listen to what he says in verse eight. He says, therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Paul says, I could just power up and say, I'm the apostle Paul. I led you to Jesus. You better treat this guy right. I can, I can, just, I can just demand it of you. But that's not what he does. He says, he says, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Is it, it is as none other than Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Paul says, I could boss you around, and I could point a finger, and I could yell, and I could stomp, and I could demand. But here's what Paul understands. Coming to people with an appeal in love changes hearts and lives for the long term. Shaking a fist and beating people down and making them do what you say will change them for a moment while they're afraid of you. But Paul's saying to Philemon, I want your heart to change. I want you to understand that this man who is coming back to you is not a slave. He's your brother in Jesus Christ. And we can't even comprehend how this would have messed with Philemon's mind because he lived in a world and breathed the air where something was so normal. You know, do you know how many things that we do as Christians that seem so normal to us because it's normal American behavior? It's really counter to what the Bible teaches. This is why we challenge you every week, to, I mean every day, open the Bible, open the Bible, open the Bible. Let God's word fill your heart and your mind because it will challenge your norms. It will challenge what you think is okay. And as God is revealing and, and, and inspiring his word, he gives this amazing picture that we can look at and learn from. Appeal gently and don't demand harshly, and that changes hearts and lives. Paul shows us that example. Then this, the dignity of relationships and not selfishly using people. There's dignity in human relationships. Verse 11 says this, formerly he was useless to you, Paul is saying to Philemon about Onesimus, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. The apostle Paul says, this is a person who I love. There's this dignity of relationship. He is a valuable human being. That's not the way slaves were seen in the first century. And, and so the idea of the dignity of relationships, not just how I can use a person, how I can leverage a person. Can I tell you, if you, if you are a business owner and you have two people working for you or 2,000 people who work for you who are answer to you, Every one of those people, the theologians would say, they use the term, were made in the imago Dei, the image of God. C.S. Lewis said, you've never met a mere mortal. Every person you meet, everybody who works for you, if you're in the military, everybody who's under your command, made in the image of God. How are you going to treat them? But I'm in charge. I'm their boss. Okay, how are you gonna treat him? A person made in the image of God or somebody for you to manipulate like a, a pawn on the chessboard of your plans? Your pawns, you send them out early in the game of chess because they can, you know, when they get knocked off, they don't matter, you know, that's just a pawn. No, there's no pawns. There's no pawns in God's creation. There's kings and queens made in the image of God. And every person that you're in charge of, that you influence, whether it's as a parent or a grandparent or a boss or a supervisor or a military commander. We remember that if we're Christians. It changes how we think, how we feel, and how we live. 
And then close engagement and not unfeeling distance. We've got to learn to engage with people, not keep them at arm's length. The Apostle Paul says, I'm sending him, I'm sending Onesimus, Onesimus, who's my very heart, back to you. I love this. I would have liked to have kept him here uh, with me so that he could take your place and help me while I'm in change for the gospel. He's saying, he's so useful, he's so helpful, I wish he could stay, but that's not the right thing. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor that you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. Paul, Paul says, he's coming back to you. And he's my very heart. And he's saying, Paul's saying, listen, I've got to know Onesimus. He's my spiritual son. He's my brother in faith. Here's the reality. Philemon would not have known Onesimus. He wouldn't have had a relationship or spoken with him or had conversations. And, and, and the apostle Paul is saying, this person who's coming back, get to know him. He's a value. He's a person who matters. Now here's the reality. You and I can't be best friends with all the thousand contacts of people we know. If, if, if in life, if you have three or four or five close friends, man, that's a gift from the Lord. But you can treat each person with dignity and look at them as a human being and interact with them. And not just treat them like they're kind of just part of the, the background, but they become part of, of life and you draw them in. And then spiritual family and not fleshly abuse. Verses 15 and 16. The apostle Paul says, perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Twice in that 16th verse, the apostle Paul says, Philemon, understand, the guy who's coming back to you is not the guy who left. He is your brother, and you need to treat him like a brother. Again, we, we cannot get our heads totally around the, 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 how challenging this would have been in the first century. But Jesus Christ has the power to change our thinking, to change our outlook, to change all of our cultural norms, what we were raised on and taught by family, by culture. God give, God's kingdom breaks in and says there's a new way of seeing people and a new way of seeing the world. And then self-sacrifice. And not stingy self-protection. Self-sacrifice. The apostle Paul, as he's wrapping up, he basically says, so if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done you any wrong or owes you anything, anything, charge it to me. I'll pay his bill. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. And the Apostle Paul would normally sign, just sign his name. He, he, would, he would dictate these letters and he would sign his name. We don't know why, but for some reason, he, you know, he would not do most of the writing. But he says, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. I mean, that's a different attitude. When Paul says, listen, I'll take care of it. That's the trans transformational power of Jesus Christ to see the world differently, see our stuff differently. I will leverage what I have to help protect and care for this person who I love. So the story of Onesimus. For some of you, you'd never even heard the words from the book of Philemon before today. Some of you have read it 40 times and maybe have a good grip on it. Some of you kind of, I've read it, but I never really got what was the, the whole storyline. But the story of Onesimus, I want to say, is our story. You say, well, this, this wandering slave, our story. Yeah, Broken, wandering, enslaved, deeply in need of grace. Listen to what Romans chapter 6 says, verses 15 to 17. What then? Shall, sin, uh, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? By no means. May it never be so. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves in sin, you have come to obey from the heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. His story is our story. We were owned by sin. But when you come to the cross, and if you haven't come to the cross, when you come to the cross and confess your sin and receive Jesus Christ, you are no longer shackled and bound to sin, but you are set free and you belong to righteousness because you belong to Jesus Christ. That's my story. That's your story. We are set free slaves because of Jesus Christ. And how can we not set others free? How can we not do what Jesus has done for us and share his story with others? The story of Philemon is our story. You say this first century Christian who owned slaves? That's my story. You, you better believe it. You better know that that's your story. You say, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. 
Philemon was blinded by his culture and his view of the world. And so he looked at Onesimus as property and as a non-person. Even though he, listen closely, even though he'd come to Jesus, he still had a totally wrong outlook and attitude. And some people would say, well, no, if he, if he still was a slave owner, he couldn't have been a Christian. I'm telling you, he was a Christian who had not yet been fully sanctified and he was still living in some parts of his life in sin. And I think in this room, there might be a couple Christians who know Jesus and believe in him but aren't totally sanctified and doing everything right for Jesus. I have a suspicion there's a few in this room. I know the guy standing on the stage is one of them. God is still making me into what he wants me to be. So we better not look back at, at, at Philemon and be judge, jury, and executioner of that evil bad man. We're better to look at our own hearts and to say, God, what are the things that are part of my family history that I'm still doing? Maybe I treat my wife like my dad treated my mom, and it wasn't good, but I watched it for so long, it's become who I am, and God wants to change me. Yeah, there's some sanctification that needs to go on in me. Maybe I cut corners in business because I can get away with it. Because, you know, if you do this or that, you don't really get caught. But Jesus says, that's not how my people conduct themselves in business. Maybe you look at other people as lower than you because of how they're different than you. And Jesus has got to say, you know me, and I know you, and I love them, and it's time to get that right. We're like Philemon because we need to be sanctified and changed to be more like Jesus. Someone please say amen. amen. We still need to be changed. You can love Jesus and still be mixed up because that's the journey of sanctification that lasts until we fall into the arms of Jesus at the end of this life. We are recipients of transformational forgiveness. If you have come to the cross, if you receive Jesus Christ, you are a recipient. You, you, you have been, been given transformational forgiveness, the grace of Jesus. If you come to the cross and you've seen Jesus crucified, bearing your sins, taking your shame, and you've confessed your sins to him and asked him to forgive you and to wash you clean. He is transforming your life. You have been transformed by Jesus and you are being transformed. That's part of the journey. And so, so we say, God, thank you for your forgiveness and keep redeeming me, keep changing me, keep, keep transforming me, keep sanctifying me, keep making me more and more like Jesus because I'm not there yet. We're on that journey. But we are also called to share transformational forgiveness. We are called to look at other people like, like the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul called Philemon to extend forgiveness whereby Roman law, he could have branded, beaten, or executed. But Roman law got tossed aside at that moment, and the kingdom of God stepped in. Now, here's the thing. We don't know. We walked out of the theater with 20 minutes left. We don't know what happened when Onesimus got back to Philemon. That's not there for us. I'm not sure exactly why. I just know it's not there, because God's wiser than I am, right? I like the whole story. I, like to see, I, don't, I don't leave in the middle of a movie. I want to see, I know the whole thing. I don't know how this one ends, but here's what I do know. There are people in your life that need your forgiveness. And because of your own experience, your own family history, your own, your friends saying it's okay to not forgive, you are still harboring unforgiveness. And God, and God is saying to us, Transfer, transformational forgiveness is yours to give. You can extend forgiveness. Some of you are terrified to forgive the person who's wronged you because you think if you forgive them, then you're saying what they did wasn't wrong. Do you understand that when you forgive someone, the first thing you are declaring is they are wrong? Or guess what? You wouldn't need to forgive them. You hear me? When you forgive, you're saying, I'm forgiving because you are in the wrong. You have sinned against me. You've sinned against God. When you forgive, you declare their wrongs. What you declare, though, is I'm not going to let the poison of unforgiveness kill me or keep me bitter towards you. When you forgive, it doesn't mean you say, I will put myself under your authority or let you abuse me or hurt me again. When you say you forgive, it doesn't mean you'll say you can keep hurting me. You may need to have a wise distance from somebody. But it's saying, in my heart, hatred and bitterness will not own my soul. Not for another day, week, month, year, or decade. For some of you, you need to leave here today and, get, and text or email or phone or go knock on the door and say to somebody, one more time, can we try to make things right? I've been holding this against you. I need to extend the grace of Jesus. Why? Because he's given me grace. And that's what we do. Lord Jesus, each of us knows our own journey, our own story, our own resistance to forgive. Each of us in some way knows, or maybe we don't fully know, 
where we've been so shaped by our family or our attitudes or our culture that we see the world wrong. Just like Philemon couldn't see through the mist and the haze of first century Rome and and he couldn't see the wrongness of, of slavery until, God, you pulled the blinders off and showed him through the Apostle Paul, Lord, may we have the blinders taken off our eyes where we are still living in and holding to sin and wrong ways of thinking. Break our hearts, remind us of your grace, and teach us to extend your grace freely to every person we meet. God, I pray as we leave here today that this little 25-verse book of the Bible would never leave our hearts, that we would grow in forgiveness and learn to see people the way you see them and to see our own frailties and uncover, God, uncover our own blindness that we might see your way and live in ways that honor and glorify Jesus. We pray this for his sake and for his glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen.